Welcome back. Trying to give you lots of breaks because I, I know that the mind can only absorb what the, what the butt can handle. <laughs> or what did she say, what your butt can tolerate? <laughs> so, um, at this point, um, we looked at step two came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Right? That would be tied into just being willing to believe that there's something other than ourselves. Right? Because obviously, if I'm not willing to believe that, that there's that uh, something other than ourselves can do it, and that I'm going to, thinking I can do it myself, right? then I'm not clear on what, the, what my insanity is. Right? Because if I'm not clear that I can't do anything about the insanity, then I don't see the, I don't see the insanity in step one. All right. So again, it, I said it before, and I think it's important is that the experience of step one has to be great enough to move me into step two with sufficient hopelessness that I really know that I need more power than what I have. All right. Which goes a long way of opening me up to this idea of God. But so far, it hasn't necessarily, we haven't even made any kind of decisions on, what, on, on this thing yet. All right? it's, just, it's just encouraged me to look at my own power, my own, my own need. So now it brings us to the beginning of step three, which I look at from page 58 and how it works. <clears throat> And in how it works, you hear it read um, a lot in, in meetings. That I, I don't know if they do it here, but in, in L.A. they do. They do it here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There is some, some twist to it, though, from the original manuscript. And I'm going to try to remember what some of those are. I actually don't have it in this book. This book actually doesn't have any notes. Did I drop something? Oh, okay. oh I thought it was mine. Um, in the original manuscript, it said, never have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed these directions. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with, with themselves. So I see from what I saw to this point that I've been constitutionally incapable of being honest with myself about a lot of things. About the idea of... of my power, thinking that I was going to be able to make some. Pardon me. Uh, that's I'll wing it. Thanks, though. <laughs> um, that uh, I've been unable to see that that uh, I needed more power, right? I always thought that the power had to come from something happening in me. That eventually I would keep myself sober. Uh, but that just never happened. I was unable to to be honest about the idea of my need for God. Right. There are such unfortunates, they're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. Right. And I could see that I was naturally incapable of grasping a, a way of life that that uh, demanded rigorous honesty. Right? It says, my chances are less than average. Now that statement could give you hope because it doesn't say you have no chance here. It just says that your, chance, your chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. Right? Do I suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders? Oh, okay, thanks. Okay, everybody wants me to read the original copy, so here it is. <laughs> I'll start again. Oh, no, I'll just pick up where we left off. 
Um, that incapable of grasping, developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. There are those two who suffer from grave emotional mental disorders, but but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Do I have the capacity to be honest with myself? Right. I don't know that I did have the capacity to be honest with myself until I really saw step one. But over and over again, I work with people who aren't willing to buy the whole package. And you have to ask that question, you know, you know what's wrong there? Is it is maybe the, the fact is that they don't have the they don't have the capacity to be honest about their condition, and still in the back of their mind they think that, that they think that there's something that they're going to do about this um, on their own. Where stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. If you have decided that you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to follow directions. Right? What I ask here is, uh, have you decided that you want what we have, and are you willing to go to any length to get this? And, uh, and when I'm working with someone, I ask him, what is it that they have that you want, and are you, you willing to go to any length to get it? Right. And basically what I believe that they have is they have a way of life conducive to staying sober. Right. And naturally, at this point, when you ask the question, are you willing to go to any length to get it? They shake their head, yes, of course. I say, okay, initial that paragraph. Because <laughs> we might have to come back to it. <laughs> Says that some of these you may balk. You may think you can find an easier, softer way. We doubt if you can. With all the earnestness of our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that you're dealing with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful, and without help, it's too much for you. But there is one who has all power, and that one is God. You must find him now. Half measures will avail you nothing. I would have thought that a half measure would, would at least avail me half. You know? <laughs> But that wasn't the case. It says, you stand at the turning point. Throw yourself under his protection and care with complete abandon. Now we think you can take it. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. And I have people go through each one of these. And and as they read each one of these steps, I, I ask them, are you willing to go to any length? to do this. And it usually stops around question nine. <laughs> right? And the discussion usually starts at that point and what you know, ten and eleven and twelve and willing are you willing to bring the uh, practice of working with others into your life. Right? Right? And we so we discuss what this is all gonna what this all means to them and, and uh, you know and if they're really willing to go to any length to get this. On page 60, it goes on to say, You may exclaim, What an order, I can't go through with it. Don't be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we're willing to go grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. And uh, back at home, a lot of people you hear use that as an excuse to, for bad behavior. Right. Well, it's spiritual progress, not perfection. Right. Or description of the alcoholic, step one. The chapter to the agnostic, step two. And our personal adventures before and after. My personal experiences, drunk and sober, have been designed to sell you three pertinent ideas. A, that you are alcoholic and cannot manage your life, your own life. Are you alcoholic? Can you manage your own life? Or B, that probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism. 
which was step two. And am I willing to believe that God can and will work in my life? It gets kind of interesting from now on here. It says, if you are not convinced of these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point or else throw it away. (laughs) If you are convinced, you're now at step three which is that you make a decision to turn your will and your life over to, over to God as you understand him. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? So here, from now on, it's going to start telling us where each step is. Right. And it's also on page 62, going to, <clears throat> it's going to tell us exactly what do they mean by that and just what do we do. Right. And it talks about now that there's a first requirement. And a lot of people don't realize that there is even a requirement before taking the first step. It says the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will could hardly be a success. This, this is a great place to go back to that page 52 and consider my life run on, on self-will. How successful will it be, you know, did that, did that look? Or how well did that work, I should say. It says we were having, back on page 52 in the bedevilments, it says we were having trouble with personal relationships. How well has self-will served me up to this point in the area of relationships? What about my emotional natures? I mean, how, how well has self-will worked with my emotional natures, with my misery and depression, with my life, making a living, having a feeling of uselessness or fear or unhappiness, can't being unable to be of real help to other people? How far has self-will gotten me up to that point in that, in, with those things? And I have them sit and contemplate that for a moment in meditation. Right? It says, on that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. And it's interesting now that Bill kind of uh, makes this kind of like this re- reference, kind of like Shakespeare's All the World's a Stage. Right? He says, each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. It's forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. Right? And that's basically the way I've lived. If I can only arrange my environment around me so that, you know, just how it has to be, then I'll be okay. What I like to do Usually if I'm sitting across from someone, I'll slip their name into this, right? But I'll use mine since I'm here, uh, up here alone. If I had someone doing it with me, I'd use their name. We could always use Jacinta's. Go ahead. Okay. If Jacinta's arrangements would only stay put. If only those people would do as Jacinta wished, then this workshop would be great. (laughs) Everybody, including Jacinta, would be pleased. Life, life would be wonderful. Right? So if Dan's arrangements would only stay put, if only those people at his home group would do as he wished, then the meeting would be good. Everybody, including Dan, would be pleased. Right? If only Dan's arrangements in his relationship would have stayed put, if only she would have done what, what Dan wished, then the marriage would have worked. Never mind. <laughs> I won't go there. Uh, if only Dan's arrangements at work would only stay put. If only those people at work would would do what I wish, then work would be so much easier. Everybody, including me, would have been pleased. So I'm here in the world thinking that if 
only these people would just do what they're supposed to do and what I need them to do, then it would be okay. And they, we all will be happy if you just do what I need you to do. Right? Uh, in trying to make these arrangements, Dan can sometimes be quite virtuous, can be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. Right? That's me. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But as with most humans, he's more likely to have varied traits. I will be nice as long as I think it's going to get me something that I need to be okay. But when I'm in the world playing God, I am attached to the way things happen around me because this is my life. Right? And if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to ruin it all. Right? So if you're not responding correctly to me being kind to you, then I'm going to see what else it might take to, to get what I, my way out of the, you know, to get you to do what I need you to do. What usually happens? The show doesn't come off very well, and Dan begins to think life doesn't treat him right. right? They're doing it to me. Dan decides to exert himself more. He becomes, on the next occasion, still more demanding or gracious, as the case may be. Right? If I'm not getting what I need out of the world, then I has, just have to push harder. Right? Trying to manage my environment. Still, the play does not suit Dan. Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, a little bit, <laughs> he is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is his basic trouble? Is Dan not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? I always thought I was just a people pleaser. But when I read this, the only reason I was trying to please anybody was a manipulation trying to get my way. Because I wouldn't please anybody if I didn't think it would serve me. Is Dan not the victim of the delusion that he can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if he only manages well? Rest is an interesting word. It's like the word wrestle comes from it. Right? Trying to in, in the delusion that I in the delusion that I can wrestle satisfaction and happiness out of this world, like force satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. You could probably substitute the word manage with control, if I could only control you well enough. Is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things that Dan wants? And do you, and do not his actions make each of them want to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show? Is Dan not, even in his best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? So now it's calling me a producer of confusion rather than harmony. So I'm the producer trying to be the director as well as the actor. So, Or actor is self-centered, egocentric as people like to call it nowadays. Now self-centered doesn't necessarily mean that I think too much of myself, nor does it mean that I think too little of myself. What it means is All I'm thinking about is myself. You're only laughing because you could relate. (laughs) He's like the retired businessman who lulls in the Florida sunshine in the winter complaining about the sad state of the nation. The ministers who sighs over the sins over the 20th century. Politicians, reformers who are sure that all would be utopia if the rest of the world would only behave. The outlaw safecracker who thinks society has wronged him and the alcoholic has lost all and is locked up. Or the AA member who's complaining about the state of the meeting and not doing anything about it. Right? Whatever our protestations are not most of our concerns with ourselves or resentments and or self-pity. Right? You know, isn't that most of our concerns? Selfishness and self-centeredness. 
that we think is the root of our troubles. This paragraph, this whole paragraph has to be proven in the fourth step. Otherwise, a lot of the other stuff that's going to follow in, in the instructions is not going to it's not going to fall into place. Because what I'm going to see is my selfish, self-centered, false notions all through my third column of the inventory. My thinking being, <coughs> being the root of my troubles. Right? And how it's driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Right? And I'll see that in the fourth step. How my self-centered thinking is powered or driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Right? We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past we have made decisions based on self, which placed us in a position to be hurt. Right? I always thought people getting in the way of what I want out of life was just this the way it is. And as long as I was getting what I needed out of life, then that was what was um, what I was supposed to be doing. And, uh, you know, and the fact that people were getting hurt around me, you know, it was easily rationalized by it's my life. Nobody should care what I'm doing with it. And, you know, so there was plenty of people in my inventory that I saw that I had hurt that... Um, I to- totally discounted their right to any claim on, on my behavior, or you know, you know that it, if I was getting what I needed out of life, they should just understand that that's the way life is. Right? So this is this becomes a really powerful paragraph because when I really see what it's saying here, I can actually read it backwards. Right, because I have deep-seated fears that set up these delusions in my mind. I'm up at the third par- line down now. I have deep-seated fears that set up these ideas in my mind, right? And out of these delusions, these lies I tell myself, comes an attitude of self-pity and 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 self-seeking actions, right? And those things. Those things drive the thinking in the third column. Right? And we'll look at that a little later when we look at the inventories. But one of the biggest biggest um, problems that I had is obviously that you guys just didn't get the script right. right? If you guys would only learn how to behave or what Dan needs, then I'd be okay. Right? But that's really obviously unrealistic. Because I was in a place where the world had to change in order for me to be okay. So one of the biggest statements of hope here is, is the next line. Where it says, so our troubles we think are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourself. If my troubles are really basically of my own making, that means that the world doesn't have to change for me to be okay. That something only has to change in me. And the alcoholic is an extreme example, not just an example, but an extreme example of self will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so, right? which was certainly the case for me. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of his, this selfishness. We must, or it kills us. Right? And God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we couldn't live up to them even though we thought though we would have liked to. Right? We looked at that over on page forty five. You know. I couldn't live up to my own set of morals. Couldn't develop the way of life, the philosophy of life that I thought I needed to be okay. Right? Neither could we reduce our self centered as much by wishing or trying on our own power. It says we had to have God's help. If you get to this point and you don't believe that you need God's help, whatever, again, I'm not telling you what God is, if you don't believe you need this power in your life, right, 
then the problem isn't here. The problem isn't in the third step. If I don't believe I need God's help here, then I don't need, I need, I don't believe, obviously, what the second step says, that I needed a power greater than myself to restore me to sanity. Right? And if I don't believe that, then I'm not getting the first step. Right? I'm managing, if I don't need a power greater than myself to restore me to sanity, then the only thing left to manage my life and keep me sober is me. Right? And that didn't work. So I told you over another page that it's going to tell me exactly um, how this program works and why this program works. Yet, when people get to the chapter on how it works, um, some people will say, well, I don't, we don't know how, this, how it works or, or why it works. It just works, right? Well, it's going to be pretty simple here because it's going to tell you exactly how this program works and why it works. <clears throat> now, they're going to be talking about the third step here. And the third step, I'm sorry, the third step, let me back up. The third step prayer is not the decision. It is an affirmation of a, of a decision. Saying the third step does not necessarily mean that you have to have this profound understanding of what that power is or what it means to you. Yet. It's just a decision to move towards that understanding and that will develop through your own work right, on what that means to you. But ultimately, this decision is to, to move towards accessing power. Right? There's a lot of different stories that I've heard. You've probably got your own out here in Australia, but there's ones like uh, there's three frogs on a, on a lily pad and one decides to jump off and swim away. How many is left on the lily pad? There's three. One just made the decision to jump off, but didn't. All right. I also see heard you know two crows on a fence. One decides to fly away. All right. How many's left on the fence? It's still two. All right. It's just a decision, but it's a decision based on my life, on the truth of what I've seen to this point. I'm making this decision based on my realization of need for power in my life. Right. Without more power, none of, none of those things on page 52 will change. Right? Without more power, right, then what's going to, what is, is going to be entering into my life that's going to change the truth about step one? Right? The unmanageability of my spirit, the obsessions of my mind. So the third step decision is right here in this next paragraph on the bottom of 62, before we even get to the prayer. And here is where it's going to talk about how this program works and why this program works. And it starts off with, this is the how and the why of it. And here's how it works. It says, first of all, we had to quit playing God. That's how it works. <laughs> it's a little too simple, right? Not so. It's not that simple, is it? Right? It's a little statement, but it's not that simple. Right? We had to quit playing God. That's how this program works. And why that works? Because playing God didn't work. So here's, here's where it's going to start talking about the decision. Next we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal. We are his children. I'm sorry, we are his agents. He is the father. We are his children. So they're talking about three relationships. Director, actor, principal, agent, father, and child. And those are three aspects of one relationship. 
right? And you can really simplify the third step decision here, all right? Simply by turning those statements into questions. First one that I'm going to pose to you guys is about the actor and about the director and the actor. And these are in that. I see some people picking up the Big Book Awakening. It's, these questions are in there. So if you didn't want to write them all down. Um, the, okay, the director and the actor. So here's the first question. How good a job have you done to this point directing your own life? Right. When I consider that, I see that I certainly tried to direct life all around me, but was never able to really stay sober or even get the way of life that I, that I thought I needed to be okay. Right? The philosophy of life that I thought would comfort me. Right? So the decision here is, is kind of simple. Right? Hereafter in this drama of life, I'm just going to be the actor and God will be the director. You hear people at meetings say, I did the third step and took it back, did the third step and took it back. Do they do that here? Yeah. yeah. What would you want to take back about the question of how good a job, how well a job you've done about directing your life? Is there anything to take back? There's nothing to take back here. You either did a good job or you didn't do a good job. Right? Nothing to take back. Here I'm making the decision that something else will direct my life. The next thought is the principal and the agent. An agent has a responsibility to be who the principal would have them be, that works for them, in, you know, as if, like a, an agent for that person acts, um, does things for that person, right? Like, um, I'm a, a real estate agent, right? And in Los Angeles, and back there, the person that hires me is my principal, and I act as a re representative for that person. I have a fiduciary responsibility to represent that person and be for that person who they would want me to be, right? So the question here is, is how good a job have I been being the principal? How good a job have I done making you be who I would have you be? <laughs> done doesn't work very well, has it? And in another level, how good a job have I done making me who I would have me be? Right? And I haven't been able to be who I want want to be either. Right? Can't make you who I want you to be, and I can't make me who I want to be. And there's nothing to take back here either, is there? Right? There's nothing that's going to change here. I Hereafter in this drama of life, um, the decision here is that God will be the principal and I will be his agent. I will be who God would have me be. Right? The next one, the next consideration is the father and child relationship. And typically, father is a provider, and it'll validate that on the next page um, as the definition for that. And that is... Uh, question here is, how good a job have I done providing what I need on my own power, by myself? Look where it got me. <laughs> All right? I see that I cannot provide what I need to keep myself sober or to relieve my spiritual malady. Right? I, cannot, I do not have the power to do any of that. So the decision here is, hereafter in this drama of life, God is going to be the Father. God will provide what I need if I turn to him. goes on to say, most ideas are simple. I think I made it pretty simple for you. And this concept was the keystone of a new and triumphant arch through which we will pass to freedom. So it says, this concept 
is the keystone. A concept to me is like a concept car is a vision of the way a car could look like in the future. Right? But they're talking about the concept of a way of life that I'm making a decision on living here. And that that concept of this way of life is the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. And the keystone is the center stone in an arch, in an archway like over a doorway. And this is the spiritual structure that we started to build like on page 17 where it talks about the powerful cement which binds us. And uh, it was the... um, the combination of the common problem and the common solution. And then in the second step, the willingness to believe. The cornerstone, the first stone in place. And now we've got the keystone, the, the top stone in this arch of our doorway. And on this side, right, in this side, we're looking at this new way of life that as we walk through this door towards this new way of life, which is, which is accomplished by four through nine, right, and living and ten, eleven, and twelve, that we'll be able to have this new way of life. So, what I like to do here is to uh, is to just get a vision of what the book says this new way of life is. And I don't like to jump usually this far ahead, but for this particular part, I do. And go to page eighty-seven. Last indented paragraph, this is step 11. This is the vision of the new way of life that we're making a decision on. It says, as we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action. It's because the decision I made in the third step that God was going to be the Father and provide, that I will turn to that power to provide what I need, it's a way of life in the 11th step that I am going to trust that that power will work in my life. We constantly remind ourselves we're no, no longer running the show. Right? We made the decision that God is going to direct my life, that I'm no longer running the show. I will just be the actor. The third step, it was just a decision. In the eleventh step, it becomes a practice, how I live. Humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, Thy will be done. What would God have me be? That was the decision we made with the principal and the agent. What would God have me be to you? To me? So, it's just a decision. But it's a decision that is a matter of life and death for me. Because if I'm clear on step one, right, I have to see that I need, I need to move towards a source of power and that it's not okay to stay powerless. Right? Towards um, a way of life where I've learned how to access power and saw that it can work. Right? goes on to say, when we sincerely took such a position... All sorts of remarkable things followed. Because we had a new employer. And being all powerful, he provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work well. Right? It's the, uh, the employer would be like the principal. And he provided what we needed. Right? Would be the father again. If we kept close to him and performed his work well, would be the director. Established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves or little plans and designs, because I'm just the actor here. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life as we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully. As we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose the fear of today, tomorrow, and, or the hereafter. We were reborn. Right? It's the child. It says, we are now at step three. And many of us said to our maker as we understood him. And here's the third step prayer. Now, I would uh, 
I'd like to skip over the third step prayer for now. Just talk about it a little bit more, but maybe we can close this particular session with that third step prayer. Right? Because I know it would just be hard to get you all back in your seats afterwards. Um, it says, we thought well before taking this step, making sure we were ready, that we could at last abandon ourselves utterly to him. What I usually do when I'm working with someone, I'll read that decision the paragraph on the decision on the third step, and I send them home to consider what this means to them, to consider those relationships, actor, uh, director, and actor, the the father and the child and the principal and the agent, what it would mean to continue to try to be the director in your life, the principal, the the father, what it would mean to continue to depend on yourself to direct your life, to provide what you need on your own power, uh, to try to continue to make other people be who you would have them be. And then on the flip side, what uh, what would it look like for you to t- take the other role? Right? And I ask them to consider that through the week so that when we get back to this um, and I look at that question... I can say, have you thought well before taking this, making this, I'm sorry, taking this step? Have you made sure you're ready to do this? You know, can you at last abandon yourself utterly to him? And the way I abandon myself utterly to, the, to, to this power is, to by, is simply by completing the rest of the steps, right? Completing 4 through, through 12. Continue to work with others, Right? It says we found it very desirable to take the spiritual step with an understanding person, such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor, but it is better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. Remember when they wrote this book, it went out before there was a lot of meetings. A lot of people just had a book and nobody else around them doing this. They just read the book and and they had to look around for someone to do a third step prayer with. The wording was, of course, quite optional so long as we expressed the idea of voicing it without reservation. If you have a problem with the prayer, you, I've known people to make up their own prayers, but I didn't necessarily feel that I needed to, um, nor do I necessarily feel that someone who's new to the process needs to worry about that. But certainly after you've done it three, four, five times, right, maybe you can come up with your own third step prayer. It says, this was only a beginning, though, if honestly and humbly made. An effect, sometimes a very great one, was felt at once. So, you know if the prayer was honestly and humbly made, right? Because you get moved through the rest of the steps if it's honestly and humbly made, right? Doesn't mean you might not stop, but you have to... But Sometimes you have to just re- refocus on why you're doing it, right? But if it's honestly and humbly ma- made, then you know why you need that power and why you need to continue, right? So, um, One of the things that uh, I'd like to point out here is um, is that the third step and the fourth step are in the same chapter. Right. And I think it's because it kind of continues the theme, because like here he's talking about, um, we're here trying to direct life and uh, playing God in the world around us and in what it talked about in the third step. And now we're going to write a script on what that exactly looked like in our life. How we've wrote scripts for other people and how we've expected you to live a certain way or be a certain way to me and you're just not following the script well enough. Right? It says at the bottom of 63, Next we launched out in a course of vigorous action. 
look at the words they used, launched, vigorous, right? Obviously, they kind of kind of encouraging us to like really just jump jump into it, right? There's another story actually about uh, that I heard from a guy in in Denver. Kind of goes along with that other frog story. Um, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> there was three frogs on a lily pad. One decided to jump off the lily pad. Um, but didn't. I'm sorry, I already messed it up. All three, all three of them decided to jump off the lily pad. Two of them jumped off the lily pad and one stayed. The one that stayed turned yellow and then drank. All right. Making the decision, making the decision to, go, to, to do this stuff and then not doing anything, right? is dangerous. So next, we launched out in a course of vigorous action because we don't want to turn yellow and drink. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. That's why we write inventory not to work on myself, but to face and be rid of the things in myself that have been blocking us. And that becomes a great prayer through the process. While I'm writing, the prayer that I incorporate into the fourth, along with the fourth step work, is God, please help me face and be rid of the things that are blocking me from you, other people, and myself. Says our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. It was the symptom of the spiritual malady that set up that condition conducive for the obsessions to return, which took me to that first drink, which set off that, that, that problem, the problem drinking, right? So the liquor was the symptom of something deep down inside. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory, and this was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It's an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damage or unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret, If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. You might want to underline that. If you're going to be successful with this, you might not want to fool yourself about the value of resentment, of hanging on to resentments. Hanging on to resentment is kind of like me me taking poison and hoping you die. Calls this a fact-finding, fact-facing process, right? I uh, early on, I was in the clothing industry, and uh, while I was still going to, sc- while I was still a teenager, I was going to say while I was still going to school, but that was not true. <laughs> I'd stopped going to school um, early on after I started drinking. Um, when I was a teenager, I was doing these. I don't know what you'd call them here. They have swap meets or flea markets? Yeah, yeah they have that here? Okay. And uh, I was buying clothes downtown and I was selling men's shirts at these swap meets and uh, picking them up uh, in various places, and, but mainly from this one place that was family-owned. Well, the factory decided to switch to women's clothes, which at first kind of bothered me, but... The clientele was better, right? <laughs> and guys rarely bought clothes, you know. It was like, once you got a shirt you like, you're going to just wear it to death, right? <laughs> so, so it was a lot more, it was a lot more activity at selling women's clothes because they came back every week and see what you've got. And anyway, I had no clue about uh, how this, uh, how that deal worked. 
but somehow you women knew when the season was over, it was time for the other stuff, right? So I remember this thing started in the summer, and I had all this summer clothes that I was throwing in this truck and lo- and bringing out to this sh- this uh, swap meet. And uh, after the summer, or just before the summer ended, actually, was the fall line. Started getting some fall clothes. And even though I stuck it all on the same racks, women seemed to be able to pick through it and pull out all the new stuff and leave all the summer stuff. You just knew the difference. It was... At that point, it was pretty much all the same to me, right? And then the Christmas line would come out. Now I had the summer line, the fall line, and the Christmas line, and somehow you guys knew exactly what the Christmas line was supposed to look like and left the fall stuff, right? And, you know, I'm selling at this open market. It's outside thing with sun beating down on this, and it's getting the little lines over the hanger marks, you know, and where the sun was hitting the top of the clothes. Right, and then there was spring. Now I had the summer stuff, the fall stuff, the Christmas stuff, and the spring stuff. And you still picked out the spring stuff, right? And I said, okay, well we're coming up on summer. The summer stuff will go. Right. So the summer line started coming in. I was making a lot more money with ladies' clothes than men's clothes. That so I pretty much stuck with it. But I needed to get a bigger truck because now I had the summer stuff, the spring. Fall stuff, the Christmas stuff, the spring stuff, now the new summer stuff. Oh, and the Christmas stuff is somewhere in between there. Anyway, and now I needed a bigger truck because I'm lugging all this stuff around in this truck. And we do that with our heads. We have all this stuff from the past that we're hanging on to, a lot of it from childhood, right? The things that we need to hang on to to validate my behavior today, why it's okay if you went through what I went through, then you would be like this too. Right? And I could put the, the blame on all of that stuff for, for why I am who I am or why this is the way it is. Right? And my head started to look a lot like this truck when I started to understand this. Right? Just full of stuff that I was, I was fooling, myself, fooling myself about the value of hanging on to it. Right? I mean, with that stuff, it was easy. You drop the price and it goes. Right? It didn't matter that it was last summer stuff if it was two for five dollars, right? <laughs> you know, right? But that started to clear all this mess out. But we're going to start to try to do the same thing with, with what we're carrying around in our heads. Start to look at this stuff and stop fooling ourselves about the value of carrying this stuff around because these resentments, these things that bother us, cut us off right? they, they block us from from this place that we're looking towards connecting with it, this strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us right this is, so we did ex- here it goes on to say we did exactly the same thing with our lives we took stock honestly first we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us. Defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. Right? And the common manifestations of self are selfishness, self-seeking, dishonesty, fear, and the way we treat people in relationships. And we'll see that through the fourth column and in the sex inventory, the conduct in- inventory goes on to say resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcohol, alcoholics than anything else. Right? Resentment destroys more alcoholics than anything else, even alcohol. Right? From resentment stem all forms of spiritual disease. Now, this is, now it's going to validate it, what I talked about in the first step. For we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. And when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Adversely, if the spiritual malady is not overcome, we're, we're in a situation that's conducive for the obsessions to return, which will take us back to the first drink. 
and it happens all around us with people that are new with, and with people with time. Right? It says, in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Right? We listed people, institutions, and principles with whom we were angry. And that's the first instruction for the fourth step. What I do here at this point is um, I, I stop at this point and send the person I'm working with home and I say, come back next week with the first column. Just list the, pe- list the people, institutions, and principles with whom you're angry. Right? A lot of people get hung up on the, on the idea of principles. Right? And I look at principles as those deep-seated ideas that block me from from being who I want to, from doing the things I want to do or being who I want to be right some people um, you know look at it differently but there's you know I look at the principles though as just the ideas that I have that, that stop me from being who I want to be like um, principle is that I'm never going to be a good enough artist, so why bother? Right? Or relationships never work, so why bother? Right? Or relationships can never work. Um, you know, just principles that that you see in your life that that stop you from doing the things that uh, that you wished you could do, or that you wanted to. I work with a lot of guys, and oftentimes I, I come across guys that say, well, I'm not resentful at anything, at anybody. I have no resentments. Right? I say, okay, well, just go back and, and consider a list of just people who bother you. And their lists end up looking just like everybody else's. Right? There's... I've noticed that some guys just don't want to admit that they're resentful at anything. They don't want to, you know, if you bother them, they're just not going to let you know. Yeah. Right? And it's usually the more self-driven ones. Right? <laughs> but if you say, okay, well, who bothers you? Right? You've got a lot of those. Right? <laughs> so then the next instruction is we asked ourselves why we were angry. Right? That's the bottom of 64. I say, okay, go, go home. Come back next week with, with a list of why you're angry at each one of these persons, each one of these people, institutions, or principles. And I tell them to take the first name off the list and put one in their name and then A, B, C, D for, the, for each reason, for each cause of the resentment. No, I put the first name on the list onto, onto, the, onto the paper and write one, then the person's name, and then A, B, and C, D for each cause of the resentment. Why not yourself? Why not myself? You could do that if you want. Right? I wouldn't put it first. Unless you, I mean, you could, but I wouldn't. I don't think it matters whether it's first or last. It doesn't necessarily matter, but, but the... Um, the point is, is to keep the causes brief. Right? The only reason for writing a lot in this column, in this section, is to, um, is to validate your hanging on to the resentment. Right? Person's name, and then you write a page on what they did to me and how it affected me and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no. Look at the examples. A, I mean, one, Mr. Brown. A, his attention to my wife. B, told my wife of my mistress. C, Brown may get my job at the office. That's right to the point. Boom, boom, boom. Right? You can elaborate on it later if you need to after you're through this. So, um...
Then what I ask the person that I'm working with to do after they've written down these causes of the resentment is to c- contemplate these items that they've wrote down. One of the things that you find common is, um, is I can say the same thing five times just to validate the resentment. They did this, they did that, they did this, and it's like really maybe they were just abusive, right? Or maybe they were they were they were just un. Uh, acted in, 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 a, uh, in a manner that, was, um, that I'm able to put into one simple sentence that was basically all-inclusive of all those resentments, of all those different causes. Right? And try not to say the same thing five times. Right? It, might not, it might not be so important if you've only got 20 names on your list, but I had 250 names in the first column with multiple letters next to each one and ended up with six or seven hundred pages that I that I might have had to write on if I didn't start getting realistic. And I've known people that have had 4,000 pages of inventory to write. They, when they asked me if I would help them, I said, I thought about that and I said, I'm not going to listen to 4,000 pages. <laughs> And I said, we're going to have to get more realistic. He had like every actor you could, more actors than names than even I could come up with. He was resentful at all of them because he wasn't one. I says, can't you just bring them all into a resentment because I'm resentful at actors that were successful? Right? Isn't that just one? And he says, oh, no, no, this is too important. I can't, I can't skimp on this. <laughs> and I would say probably... 2,000 of them were um, uh, political, political figures, right? different people in government, in the American government. And, and it's like, wouldn't that all have been, been couldn't you have just said, like, like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the U.S. government? <laughs> you know? What the problem with that is, is not... I don't have. I don't tell people how many to write. Right? I try to help them be realistic. Right? This person didn't finish. We have a friend that had two thousand um, resentments, and he finished. But you know, but he didn't have to work either. <laughs> right? So he, you know, he sur- he could survive without it, um, with putting that much time into it. But, and I've seen people finish these tomes of, of inventory but I've also had the experience of doing inventories after the first one which were just five or ten pages of people five or ten people where I've had bigger experiences because I wasn't necessarily drowning in all of this information so I'm not saying that it should be five or ten but I'm saying it probably certainly sh- isn't worth doing four thousand right it's certainly beneficial to be realistic. Am I really resentful at this person? These are the causes of my resentment. Can I, can I say that in one, in one phrase, right? You know, will one, will one line sum that up? And then I write a page on that. Because each one of these inventories are going to take up a whole page of paper. And when we come back, we're going to take another break. We've got some examples of that inventory that we're going to pass out and we'll start to look at at uh, the next part of it thanks <laughs>